So 1 Samuel chapter 12, we see Samuel's speech. Uh, it's following, of course, Saul's inaug inauguration and a great time of rejoicing. If you recall last week, if you just look back there at verse, uh, verse 14 of 1 Samuel 11, the story kind of ended pretty nice. You know, they had Nahash come up, threaten them. Samuel gathers all Israel. They go and defeat him. And then it says they all went to, they went to, to Gilgal to make him king. It says in verse 14, Then Samuel said to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So it ends on this real high note last week. But then, of course, you know, leave it to the preacher to come along, you know, and kind of and bear some bad news to everybody. Samuel's speech here that we just read is a very somber. You know, it's, it's more befitting of, you know, a, a, a day of judgment. Or, you know, it's not something you, you would look forward to. So he's, he's literally, and he literally rains on their parade when you think about it. He literally calls for thunder and lightning and, and the rain comes and, we, and rains on them. And it reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 when I was reading it, when Paul said to the Corinthians, you know, ye are full, ye are rich, ye have reigned, reigned as kings without us, and I would, good, would to God that you did reign, that we also might reign with you. Right? And he's kind of rebuking them for saying, hey, we're fools for Christ's sake, but you guys are wise. You know, we're despised, and, and you guys are honored, you guys are reigning as kings there in, in Corinth. And then, of course, he kind of takes them down a notch at the end of 1 Corinthians 4, and he says, you know, some of you are puffed up, that I would not come to you, but if I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will you? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and the spirit of meekness? And what I'm bringing that up for is, is because sometimes the preacher's job is just to get up and tell, us to it, tell it to us straight. Right. I mean, that's what Samuel's doing here. He's saying, look, I'm glad you got your king. I'm glad you guys had a good time. I'm glad you enjoyed the sacrifices. But just like Paul, you know what? Sometimes you just got to lay it on the line and tell people exactly how it really is. And sometimes that, you know, that involves having to take people down a notch. And that's the preacher's job. You know, the, the preacher has to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That's two negatives and a positive. You know, reproving and rebuking is not always fun. And it's not always easy, but that is the job. And that's what we see Samuel doing here in chapter 12. He's kind of bringing these people down a notch. And in this chapter, Samuel basically is telling them that they've made a bad decision in desiring them a king. He tells them they made out a, a bad decision, and then he gets real specific. You know, he points out the fact that they're backsliding, and he gives them this speech there telling about how it was the Lord that delivered them all these other times, but now you're, you're you know, asking for a king, you're not seeking the Lord. So he's pointing out their backsliding. And of Israel, they take it, you know, but then they start to kind of backpedal. You know, they're trying to say, oh, well, pray for us, you know, that, that we don't die. You know, pray for us for this evil that we've done. And in the end, they're told what? They're told to just, you know, kind of buck up. You know, if, if you're, I don't know if that's just a Midwestern saying that I'm bringing down here to the Southwest, but to buck up. Who knows what that means? You know, it's kind of like keep your chin up, you know, suck it up. You know, something I say to my, one of my children, I won't say which one, you know, suck it up. You know, I won't embarrass them too bad. <coughs> but... You know, 1 Samuel chapter 12, if I were going to give this an alternate title, I would call it Making the Best of Bad Decisions. Making the Best of Bad Decisions. And that's what we see going on here. And this is important to, to understand because, you know, life is a series of decisions. You know, life is just one decision after another. Some decisions are very big and some decisions are very, you know, minuscule and not as important. But we're all sinners. You know, we're none of us are perfect. We're going to make bad decisions. Hopefully we don't, make really, we don't make really bad decisions on the really big decisions in life. But, you know, there's going to there's gonna be times when we mess up. You know, we make a mistake. Maybe we've made bad decisions in the past that we have to live with. And I believe when we look at this chapter, we can see how to make the best out of bad decisions. We can, we can learn how to handle it. And we can also learn how to avoid making fewer of them. Or we can learn how to make fewer of them, I should say. So first of all, in order to make the best of a bad decision, you have to admit, you know, when you're backslidden, because that's usually when the worst decisions are made. You know, we make bad decisions when we're not right with God, when we're walking in the flesh, we're not in the spirit, and we start to make brash decisions when we're backslidden. And in order to make the best of a, of a bad decision, you have to admit that, you know, you've made a bad decision and that you're backslidden. <coughs> you know, backslidden people, they make bad decisions just like Israel. And that's what Samuel was pointing out here. He's saying, look, you guys are backslidden, and you made a very bad decision. Look there in verse 1. It says, And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice, and all that ye have said unto me, and have made a king over you. He said, I gave you what you want, 
And now behold, the king walketh before you. Here he is. You, you got what you asked for. And I am old gray-headed, and my sons are with you. Remember, that was their complaint. We'll talk about that in a minute. Your sons not walk down your ways. He says, well, then my sons are with you, and you've got your king. You made your decision. And he said, verse 3, Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, that, or whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? And I will restore it you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken of any man's hand. And he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and has anointed his witness you against this day. Of course, that's referring to Saul, his anointed. That you have not fought, uh, found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. So the question is, what's the problem? Why, why do you need a king then, when you've got a man of God right here? Now I understand he's old and gray-headed. And of course, they want to you know, project and say, well, the problem is Samuel's sons. You know, and, that, you know, and there is a legitimate concern there because you know, those guys were not right with God. Right? If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 8, they want to say, oh, well, it's his sons. You know, his sons are the problem. That's why we've got to get a king. And really, his sons, if you go back to 1 Samuel 8, all they really were are just this convenient target for them to kind of just you know, project their own shortcomings, for them to just kind of blame shift and say, you know, the problem is his sons. You know, we know you're old and you've done right by us, but you know, your kids are going to mess it all up. You need to give us a king, right? right. Look there at 1 Samuel chapter 8. We, we should be familiar with this. It says, and it came to pass when Samuel's old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. You know, they might have started out good when we preached through this. We talked about that. It doesn't say they started out bad. They just got in that position. Maybe they didn't earn it. They took it for granted. And it says, now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiah. And they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and for ju perverted judgment. So they were corrupted. Doesn't say they were full blown sons of Belial, like Eli's sons or something like that. Just they were just guys that got in a position, and you know what? They they went after they were became greedy of filthy lucre, which is possible, something that can that we all have to be on guard for. But he says in verse four, he says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Saul and to Ramah and said to them, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons not walk not in the ways. And what, what but here's the problem though, is the next few words, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Did they have a legitimate complaint about his sons? Yeah, they did. But the problem is, the, is the, the solution that they proposed. They said, now make us a king like all the, na all the nations. You know, in Samuel here, what's interesting in, in, in chapter 8 is that he doesn't defend the fact that his sons were bad. You know, he doesn't say, no, no, you guys got it all wrong. You don't understand. He admits, look, they're bad. He says, yeah, it, it's, it's not right. His problem that, sa that Samuel had with the people was the solution that they wanted. You look at verse 6, it says, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Your kids are corrupt. No. When they said, Give us a king to judge us, that's what upset Samuel. Because Samuel knew what they should have said is, Raise up a godly judge. Lord, deliver us. Lord, deliver us from our enemies. <coughs> and of course, God agrees with them in verse 7, and it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and what they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. That was the problem with Israel, is that they were rejecting God. Yeah. All Samuel's sons were, were just a convenient target to just you know, project their own shortcomings on them and just say, oh, it's their fault. Okay? But what the, what's really going on is that they're backslidden. And it's a lot easier to just blame other people, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, than just to admit that you know, we're the ones that have the problem. Like, like Israel, like it was easier for them to say, oh, it must be his sons that's the problem. You know, and then we need a king. So the problem is Israel is falling back into the same cycle of backsliding and forsaking the Lord God. Okay, that's why they're saying, give us a king. They're not saying, give us another righteous judge like you, Samuel. They're not crying out to God. They're saying, Let make us like the world. And they're forsaking the Lord. If you look there in 1 Samuel chapter 12, <coughs> It says, in, or excuse me, I'm sorry, back in, go, go back, I'll just read to you. It's from 1 Samuel 8. It says, uh, that they, he says, they have rejected me that I should not reign over them according to all the works that they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt even unto this day. So God's calling them on the carpet too. Saying, look, they've been like this since the day I brought them out of Egypt. They reject me and that's just the way they do things according to all the works that they have done. Wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they do also. And he's saying, look, nothing's changed. It's just Israel backsliding again, Samuel. That's what's going on here. And in chapter 12, where you are, you know, Samuel's just really, when we think about it, he's just reiterating what God told him in 1 Samuel 8. 
He said, isn't that exactly what he said there? He said, look, since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, this is what they've done. And then in chapter 12, that's exactly what Samuel reminds them of. It says in verse 6, And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt. Right? He's just, he's just delivering God's message, reiterating what God told him in chapter 8. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did uh, to you and to your fathers. So just to kind of make application on this first point, that in order to, to learn how to you know, make the best out of a bad decision, is, is you've got to admit, admit when you made a bad decision. And you have to be able to you know, admit when you're backslidden. <clears throat> when people backslide, what they often do is they become blame shifters. Probably everyone's heard that term, right? Blame shifters. They want to just shift the blame from them onto somebody else. Israel doesn't want to just own up to the fact that they're backslid and just want to be like all the other nations, that they're tired of the system, the judges, they're tired of doing things God's way, that they're just repeating what they've been doing ever since they came out of Egypt, just continually forsaking the Lord. Rather than do that, they just want to say, oh, oh it's Samuel's sons. And they're blame shifting. They're not owning up. They're not admitting that they're backslidden. So people get backslidden and they become blame shifters. But why do they do that? In order to justify of getting what they want in order to justify of, to, of the getting of what they want. So they can say, well, I want something. It's not something I should have. It's not something I should desire. But if I'm backslidden and can just make it out like it's somebody else's fault, then it'll, I'll feel okay about having it. I mean, one way we can say this is kind of abstract concept, right? Well, let's just bring it home, okay? Think about this. Think about how people blame spouses because they want a divorce. They're, you know, the, no one ever gets a divorce and says, it's all my fault. You know, I was terrible. I was a really bad husband. I ignored my wife. I didn't take care of the finances. You know, I was messing around, running around, whatever. It's always, oh, she's the problem. Right. You know, she comes and she wants a divorce. Oh, he's the problem. It's not that, you know, I was, uh, you know, always henpecking him and, you know, bossy and not submissive and just wanted to always do my own thing. And we weren't on the same page on anything, you know, and I wasn't going to get on his page. You know, it, it's, it, think about that. You know, that's one way that people justify or blame shift, you know, blame the other person rather than admitting that they're the problem, that they're the ones that need to get, get right. And, you know, often in that situation, it's both people that got to get right. You know, and that's, that's one area you could apply this to. You know, people blame spouses for divorce and get divorced. But then I always kind of wonder, I want to ask these people, like, well, what were they like when you married them? <laughs> were they like that? Were they exactly like what you're complaining about when you married them? Well, then it's still on you. Because you married them, right. knowing that. <coughs> but usually that's not how it goes. You know, they were everyone sweet and nice and getting along when they get married and so on and so forth. That's really a whole other sermon. I'm just trying to make application, you know, a practical sense that when people, uh, you know, instead of making the best out of bad decisions or getting out of a bad situation or trying to fix things, what they do is they just blame shift on the other person to just justify what they want. They want out of the divorce because they're the problem, not me. Israel doesn't want another a godly king they or a godly judge. They want a king to be like all the other nations. So, you know, the system of the judges is just corrupt. I mean, look at Samuel's sons. It doesn't work. Give us a king. And they're blame shifting. <laughs> How about this? Children blame parents and then go live wickedly. They say, oh, my parents are such hypocrites. You know, so now I'm just going to go run off and just live for the world and get involved in all kinds of sin. That happens. <coughs> But, you know, just because you're in, in your old newsflash to all the kids, you know, your parents aren't perfect. You know, and what you might perceive or just call, oh, hypocrisy is really just the fact that they're not perfect. Yeah. You know, and then they're, they're going to make mistakes just like anybody else. Yeah. You know, and they've probably been very gracious and long-suffering towards you as children. You know, we should do the same for our parents. Yeah. Instead of, you know, it just, you know, and, and think about, you know, that how wicked that is to say, well, my parents, you know, this or that. And just go off and, and, and blame them for you not living for God. It's wicked. <coughs> I mean, just because your parents aren't perfect, does that give you the right to just go to the, to the extremes of sin? It doesn't. But people, people will blame others. They'll blame shift when they're backslidden in order to get what they want, to justify it. Say, well, I can live like this because, you know, my parents were this or that. You know, people blame preachers, you know, and they quit church. That happens all the time. And look, I'm just, you know, we have a lot of people right now that are, are leaving church right now. <laughs> you know, not just here, but up in Phoenix, people are going for the right reasons, okay? So I feel like I have to put that out there. 
You know, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But we do often see what? When you see people quit church, right? They blame the preacher. Well, you know, the preacher is this, the preacher that. And I, I'm out of here, you know. And it's fine if people want to go to another church and, and continue to live for God. They just, hey, maybe they just say, they leave quietly and just say, you know what? We just needed a change. We just, you know, that's fine. I'm, that's, by all means, go on and live for God. But when people just leave in a rage, you know, and they go on YouTube and are just railing on this person, that person, you know, and, and they basically just quit living the Christian life. Well, what they're doing is they're blame shifting. What they're doing is saying, oh, it's the, it's the, it's the preacher's fault. And now I'm not going to live for God. And it's all his fault. And people do this all the time. You hear it all the time. You know, well, maybe not all the time, but you do hear it. I'm, I'm sure others in the room have heard this. You know, I, I used to, I'd go to church, but it's full of hypocrites. You know, that might be true in some churches, and it never should be. But does that give you the excuse to just, you know, blame other people just so you can justify you not living for God? No. So people, they get backslidden, and then they start to blame shift other people that are around them so they can just justify getting a new spouse, living a life of sin, not living for God, whatever it is. People get backslidden and become blame shifters. Why? In order to avoid admitting fault. <laughs> you know, and this is, this is just part of human nature because it goes all the way back to Adam, right? If you go, actually go over to Genesis chapter 3. I know it's a familiar passage, but it's there. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting. It's worth taking note of. Why do people do that? Why do people get backslidden, start blame shifting, get out of the will of God, living a life of sin? Why don't they just admit that they're wrong and get right? Why don't they just admit, hey, I'm the problem. Let me fix my own heart. Let me fix my life and live for God or whatever and get the sin out of my life. Because blame shifting's easier. Because you don't have to swallow any pride to blame somebody else for your problems. <laughs> Look at, and that's just the way mankind is. That's just human nature. We all have it in us. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, And the Lord called unto Adam and said to him, Where art thou? Now, that's a, that's a hypothetical. Because <laughs> God knows exactly where he is, right? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I, and I hid myself. Well, good luck with that. That's like the last person you want to play hide-and-seek with is God. <laughs> you're going to lose. I don't care how big a fig leaf you get, Adam. You're going to fail every time. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Another hypothetical. I mean, do you think God doesn't know everything that's just taking place? <laughs> and, and, what, and, you know, you think Adam at the, at the point would be like, you yeah, got me, you know. <laughs> I took of the tree and I did eat. You know, it's my fault. Eve was there. She saw me do it. You got a witness. Hast thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee? Thou should, shouldest not eat. And the man said, yeah, I did. Now, what's he do? He blame shifts. Yeah. The, uh, the woman. Uh, whom thou gavest to me. So it's, it's, it's kind of God's fault, too. Yeah. You're the one who gave me this woman. <laughs> you know, why'd you give me her? You know, could have given me the other one. Take another rib, you know. <laughs> Maybe you should have gotten a different rib, Lord. Pulled one from the other side, and this wouldn't have happened. So it's kind of your fault. He's blame shifting here, and so just owning up to it. The woman that thou gavest to me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. I mean, she just, you know, pulled, pinned my arm behind my back, held the fruit in my face, shoved it in my mouth, and plugged my nose, and I had to swallow. I didn't have any choice in the matter. Blame shifter. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, the women were like, yeah, that's right. Man's fault, right? Well, the woman's not off. She's not any better, right? And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? Uh, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And that is true. She did get beguiled. But again, she's, she's saying, look, it's somebody else's fault. Look, backsliders aren't fooling anyone but themselves. When they say, oh, it's so-and-so's fault, it's so-and-so's fault. Sometimes a third party can just step back at a situation and see what's going on and say, no, it's your fault. And you're tr you're the only person you're kidding is yourself. When people are, are getting divorced for whatever reasons. You know, you can step back and say, well, no, you're both to blame. You both have a part in this. They're not fooling anyone but themselves. God knows the truth. The Bible says in Galatians 6, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. He doesn't deceive everybody else. He deceives everybody else when he thinks himself to be something when he is nothing. Well, I'm right. I'm justified you know, in what I want. They're the problem, not me. They're thinking something of themselves that they aren't in that situation. They're really nothing, and the only person that they're fooling is themselves. <coughs> So 
So if you're backslidden, you know, quit blame shifting. Just be honest with yourself and get right. You want to make the best of a bad decision? Admit you're wrong. Admit you made a bad decision. And, and, and admit it. And get right with God. Repent. <laughs> and that's why people don't do it. Because it's so, and that's why people blame shift. Because it's so much easier just to blame everybody else for our problems. <laughs> if you want to admit uh, that you make, the, if you want to make the best of a bad decision, you have to admit you made a bad decision. It's really that simple. And that's what Samuel's trying to do here. To remind them, look, you guys have just made a very bad decision. And you're going to have to live with it. That's what an honest preacher like Samuel will help you with. Will get up and not just say, oh, you know what? I understand you want to get a divorce. And you know what? That's probably God's will. I've heard Baptist preachers say, I've heard independent, fundamental Baptist preachers go to people that are already divorced and tell them, well, it was never God's will for you to marry that person anyway, so you should probably just remarriage or remarry. The Bible calls that adultery. Right. Whosoever shall put away his wife causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Yeah. Saving for the cause of fornication. I know I got that you know, forward and backward. That's the clear teaching of Scripture. But there's plenty of Baptist preachers today they are going to stand, will get up and tell you, will come to you and say, oh no, you're, you're, you're totally fine. Go ahead and do that. <coughs> not this one. <laughs> and not Samuel. Amen. You know what they'll tell you? You made a bad decision. But you know what? You just need to make the best of that. Yeah. That's what an honest preacher will tell you. Look, I mean, that's what Samuel's doing in verse 6. He says, and, he's, and, he said, and Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron. Look at verse 9. When they forgot the Lord their God. Uh, that's, that's when... Uh, I should probably read the rest of that because it makes it sound like that's what Moses and Aaron did when I read it. Verse 8, When Jacob was coming to Egypt and your fathers cried to the Lord, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sent them in the hand of Sisera. He's saying, you know why Ashtaroth is, or, or not Ashtaroth, or uh, uh, what's his name? The guy we've been talking about. Nahash. You know why Nahash is knocking on your door? And it's because you have forgotten the Lord your God because you're backslidden. That's what he's telling him here in this passage. Look at verse 12. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the, uh, the, king of the children of Ammon, came against you, you said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God was your king. Look, you, he said you could have had help, but you had forsaken the Lord your God. You've, and, and you've made a bad decision. And he says there at the end, and the people said unto Samuel, so he reminds them, he's basically, if you read this passage, just telling them, look, the reason why you're in this situation is because you keep doing what you've always done as a people, forsaking God, forsaking God. It's not me. I haven't defrauded anybody. My sons are with you. But you know what? You, and you asking yourself a king, you've, added a, you, you've asked a wicked thing. In order to make the best of a bad decision, you have to understand something that there's no backpedaling. Once you've made a bad decision, that's it. You made a bad decision. There's no backpedaling. <coughs> and that's kind of what they do there at verse 19 after he lays it on the line and tells them exactly how it is. And they say, And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not, for we have added unto all our sin this evil to ask us a king. They finally admit it. Now they say, Oh, we are backslidden. And you know what? We have added evil unto us in asking ourselves a king. But you know what? There's no getting out of that decision. It's too late. You can't backpedal. In order to make the best of a bad decision, you have to understand that once you've made a bad decision, you, that's it. There's no backpedaling. You've made that decision. Sin's consequences are permanent quite often. They're permanent. One bad decision is all it takes to do irreparable harm. I mean, we should really think about that. <laughs> you know, if we're tempted by sin or if we want to do something we know we shouldn't and we think, well, what's the worst that could happen? What's the, the worst that could happen is the worst happening. <laughs> it only takes one bad decision, and it's irreparable harm. I mean, think, let's go back to our example of Adam, right? Just a little fruit. Looked nice. was pleasant to the eyes. Made one wise. What could possibly go wrong here? Wherefore, by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Thanks, Adam. I hope it tasted good. But after all, it was just one bad decision. What's well, the worst that could happen? Oh, I don't know, just condemn all of humanity for all of eternity? <clears throat> for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. 
Look, people, they, 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 they need to understand that they're going to make the best out of a bad situation is that, or a bad decision, is that once you make a bad decision, that decision's been made, and there's no backpedaling out of it. And people live with regret because of bad decisions for the rest of their life often. Like I quoted to you earlier from Galatians 6, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And that's just a law in the universe. That's just one of God's laws. That whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. It's up to you what you're going to reap by, you determine what you're going to reap by what you sow. You know, if you just keep sowing bad seed, don't be surprised when you get a bad crop. But that could work for you or against you. You know, and it's real easy to make bad decisions when everything's going well. When people think, I'm untouchable. They think, oh, you know, I'm six feet tall and bulletproof. I got, I've got, you know, everything's just perfect. Obviously, got, I mean, I must be doing the right thing because, you know, nothing bad's happening. You know, I guess the preacher was wrong. I guess he didn't know what he's talking about. I mean, I'm, I'm fat and sassy. You know, and I'm, I'm enjoying sin and the pleasures of sin for a season. It's there. It's easy to make bad decisions when things are going well. I mean, remember how 1 Samuel chapter 11 ended? All the men of Israel greatly rejoiced, or rejoiced greatly. They're like, hey, we got our king. Everything's going good. All right, let's have some sacrifices. Let's enjoy this time. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. You know, when things are going well, that's when people kind of let their guard down. And they stop taking heed. And they start to make bad decisions that they can't backpedal out of. You know, don't think you're going to get away with sin just because it's all clear skies. I mean, you look there in verse 17, it says, it is it not wheat harvest today? What he's saying there is, look, it's, this is not the time of year it's supposed to rain. It's wheat harvest today. This is the time of year that we go out and gather all the crops. It's bright, sunny, you know, it's sunny days, you know, not a cloud in the sky. Everyone's rejoicing greatly. You don't think anything's going to happen. But you know what? If you keep going on like that, you keep sowing to that bad seed, sowing to the flesh, sowing to the flesh, eventually, it's just a matter of time before God kind of, just like in our story, clouds up and starts to rain. In the, even in the middle of, of harvest. Even in the middle of, 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 of uh, you know, the wheat harvest. Well, I, d I didn't think it God was going to actually come. I mean, everything was going so great. Everything was going so well. I mean, I was doing whatever I wanted. You know, I know I was, had some sin in my life, but I didn't think it was that big of a deal. It was just, what was the worst that could happen kind of a thing? And then just out of nowhere, everything, you know, God just rain, clouds up and rains on you. Look, nobody goes into sin saying, thinking, this is going to end very poorly, <laughs> and then goes and does it. No one gets into sin or gets backslid and goes, I'm sure this will destroy my life. Everyone thinks, I'm going to get away with this. Yeah. And then they don't. And then they can't backpedal. Then they can't take it. There's no take backs with sin. <clears throat> and people, you know, they, they, uh, uh, they, they, they live with regret because of bad decisions. And not only that, they ruin their reputation sometimes. They ruin their reputation because of bad decisions. You know, and I, and I feel like, again, I need to make some practical application. You know, some, re some real life applications when you, when you preach like this. How about, how about ruining your reputation through bad decisions like adultery? I mean, that's what the Bible says. Go over to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. You know, today, people, people you know, in the world, they flaunt adultery. They call it everything but adultery. It's an affair. You know, I don't even like that word, you know, cheated. What, are you playing Monopoly? <laughs> Is it a board game? No, it's called adultery. And people ruin their reputation. That's what the Bible says. You know, maybe not with the world. You can do it, you know, with people actually care about this type of thing. You could ruin your reputation with God's people. Proverbs 6, Proverbs 6 uh, chapter, thir or chapter 6, verse 32. But whoso committeth adultery with the woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. And I believe he's talking about his person, you know, your body, your reputation, not your actual, you, you condemn yourself to hell, although that is a sin. He says there, though, a wound and a dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. You know, you ever see people have really bad wounds somewhere, real visible? They have a big scar. Like I got, it's gone away a little bit, but I got this when I was six. You know, and it's, there's a story behind that. You know, it was my fault, though. 
I'll, I'll admit it. <laughs> you know, but it, it's there, you know. You, you know, you get a wound when you commit adultery. That's what the Bible's saying here. That when you go out and commit adultery and it, you're found out, it's like us getting a scar on you. You're wounded. It's going to scab over. It might even heal, but people are going to be able to look at that and say, adulterer. It's going to ruin your reputation. Reputation. It says, a wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Is he talking about that God's not going to forgive sin? No, he's talking about among men, that your reproach should not, will not be wiped away. That you're going to have that scar, you know, the, the, the scarlet letter type of a thing. That you're going to ruin your reputation. Now, I mean, I remember I worked for a guy back in Michigan. You know, a good Catholic guy, married, bunch of kids. But everybody knew about his adultery. He never told me about it, but everybody else told me about it. His old church, I mean, he had a wound and a dishonor. And that was just what he was known for. A nice guy, adulterer. How about, you know, uh, how about this? People lose their lives over bad decisions. You know, there's, there's some decisions that you make that you can't backpedal from. You just, you can't take it back. Adultery is one of them. You know, people make, uh, lose their lives over bad decisions. You know, I've shared it before, but I, I had a friend in high school. Got drunk at a party, hopped in his car, his buddies just let him go. Crashed into a light pole, burst into flames, and burned to death while he's passed out. And probably other people in this room got stories like that. People make one bad decision, and it could cost them their life. Had another friend, you know, got drunk, same thing. It's always alcohol. Yeah. Got drunk, walking down some snowy road at night, and got hit by a county plow truck. Was laid in the hospital for weeks. Even after they cut open his skull to let the brain come out from the swelling, he still died. One bad decision is all it takes to just ruin your life. There's no backpedaling. And that's what Israel's trying to do. Oh, pray for us for adding this evil unto us. People ruin their reputations. People lose their lives over bad decisions. I mean, we're going back, bring it back to adultery. Look at verse 34. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. You know, that used to be a, th a thing. And today, they'd probably lock you up for doing it. But, you know, you'll commit adultery with someone's wife. Don't be surprised if the husband, when he finds out, comes and, you know, tries to kill you. Take you out. Crime of passion. He will not regard any ransom. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, what, what can I do to make it up? Nothing. There's nothing you can do to make it up. You know, you can go jump off a cliff or I can throw you off kind of a thing. That's what this is talking about here. He will, neither will he rest content though thou givest many gifts. Because that one bad decision, and I've known people that have done this. I've known people that have committed adultery, the spouse found out on it, and even after it all came out and they were, and it, everyone was, you know, it kind of blew up and had did its thing, just like a year later, the spouse sees the person in a grocery store, follows them out of the parking lot in their car and tries to run them off the road. <laughs> I can't believe they do that. Jealousy is the rage of a man. Yeah. And he will not spare in the day of vengeance, though thou givest many gifts. One bad decision. Ruin your whole life. So, again, in order to make the best of a bad decision, you have to admit when you're backslidden that you've made a bad decision. You know, and in order to avoid making bad decisions, you should probably understand that some decisions you make, there's no backpedaling. There's no taking them back. In order to make the best of a bad decision, you have, to, you have to admit that what you've done is wrong and you have to be willing to suffer the consequences. There's no backpedaling. And lastly, in order to make the best of a bad decision, you have to buck up. That was that term I used earlier. What I that mean by that is, you know, start behaving right. Behaving, that's, it literally means behaving in a more positive and efficient manner. That's what the meaning of that phrase, you know, basically what we would say is repent. You know, you need to buck up. And that's what, you know, Samuel does in this chapter. He says, look, you guys have made a bad decision. And they admitted it. And they said, look, we can't, you know, there's no back. And they tried to backpedal, but there isn't any. And he says there in verse 19, And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not. For we have added unto all our, our sins evil, this evil to ask us a king. And Samuel, son of the people, fear not, for you have done all this wickedness. He's not saying, oh, it wasn't that bad. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry for being so harsh. He said, you know what? No, you have done all this wickedness. Yet turn not aside from the following the Lord, but serve him with all your heart. 
You know, sometimes you make a bad decision, you have to just, you know, admit it and then just keep right on living for God. Not just let it keep you down. You need to buck up when you've made a bad decision. To make the best of a bad decision, you have to start making the right decisions. That's what I mean by bucking up. You know, part of that, you know, the starting uh, of, of, of uh, making, you know, of making the right decisions is to understand, you know, you can only control what you will do. You can only control what you will do. You can't not control what you have done. Okay, that's the point I'm trying to make here. The past is the past, as they say. What happened, happened. Bad decision, it's too late. It's done. There's no taking it back. There's no backpedaling. All you can do now is just buck up and continue to serve God. He said, look, you have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord and serve Him with all your heart. It's your life's not over because you made a bad decision. Now, people make, this, and they make bad decisions or whatever, they, and they just think their life is over. That's not true. You know, if your life was over, you wouldn't be here right now. God still has something for everybody to do. I don't care what they've done in their past. If you're still here, God can still use you. <coughs> you know, and part of you know, learning to make the best of a bad decision to understand is that you can't control what you have done. All you can control is what you are going to do going forward. Go over to 1 John chapter 3. We'll end over here. 1 John chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 5. It says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellow fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Say, so, well, you know what? I've made bad decisions in the past. I've walked in darkness. Okay, well, get out of the darkness and get in the light and walk with him and have fellowship one with another. And you know what? God will cleanse all sin. You know, that's, it'll be forgiven. It'll be forgotten. Whosoever shall confess and forsake his sins shall have mercy. You know, but whosoever will cover the sins shall not prosper, the Bible says. I'm paraphrasing. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Right? People need to admit when they've, when they've made a bad decision. I'm backslidden. I made a bad decision. Not blame, blame shift. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And that's what's going on here in 1 Samuel chapter 12 at the end. They're confessing. They're saying, look, pray for us. Uh, and that, that, uh, th for we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. Pray for us that we die not. That's them confessing. That's them getting called on the carpet and saying, you're right, Samuel. We're not going to blame shift. We're, not, we're, gonna, we're gonna buck up, we're gonna admit this, and then they're gonna move on. And that's what he says, that's what he says there. Look, turn not aside from following the Lord. Confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you all, uh, uh, our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, God is willing to let us live down bad decisions that we've made and make the best of things. That's a big part of, of learning how to make the best of bad decisions is learning how to live it down and understand that God has forgiven that. You know, sometimes, I, even for myself, just a personal example, I think about things that I did 20 years ago or I think about people that I used to run with 20 years ago and I ask myself, why am I even thinking about that? Why am I still beating myself up about that? Why am I still going, oh man, you know? Why am I still cringing over this? Why am I coming to God again saying I'm sorry? God's going, what are you talking about? I've forgiven that. I've cleansed it all unrighteousness. You've confessed that. I don't even know. It. It's in the sea of God's forget forgetfulness. I've cast your sins behind my back. Amen. As far as the east is from the west, I've you know, removed our, you know, your, what is it, your transgressions from, uh, from you. You know, what are you bringing this up for again all these years later? <laughs> you need to just buck up. You need to just admit what you did was wrong and go on and live your life. <coughs> God is willing to let us live down bad decisions. <coughs> and allow us to make the best of things. He says in verse 21 of 1 Samuel 12, And turn ye not aside, for then ye should go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Obviously, it's best to not make bad decisions at all. 
It's, it's best if we just turn not aside and go after vain things. That's optimal, right? You know, and, and there's a lot of people in this room that have that. That's, that's an opportunity for them. That's an option to live life and just, you know, instead of having to go find out for themselves, just trust the preacher, trust other people around you that are telling you that's a bad decision. Don't do it. There's no reason you to go find out for yourself. You know? Well, how do you know run, stepping out in front of a Mack truck is all that bad? Have you ever done it? No, but I understand a few things about physics and inertia. <laughs> you know, I, I understand the theory behind it, that if I step out in front of a moving object going at high rate of speed, I'm going to get killed. I don't have to go test that. It, the, best, you know, the, the best option is for people to just never make those bad decisions at all. Right. Or keep them to a very, to a minimum. Look, nobody's going to be perfect. People are going to make bad decisions. But hopefully, you know, some of the worst decisions you ever made are going to be minuscule. That's still on, the still on the table for a lot of people in this room. Now, obviously, th there's, there's people, you know, self-included in this room that have already made bad decisions and, and are suffering for it you know, because they're permanent. These decisions, they affect us. <coughs> You know, if that's us, just admit it. Admit it and then own it like they did here in, in 1 Samuel 2 and don't forget who you are, that you're still God's child, that God still has something to do. Look at verse 22. For the Lord will not forsake his people or his great name's sake because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Look, I don't care what decisions you've made, bad decisions you've made in your, in your life. Just like Israel made a real bad decision here, that didn't change the fact that they were still God's people. That God still cared about them, that he was still pleased to use them as his people. God is more than willing to forgive you and to help you make the best of a bad decision. We just have to do our part. Verse 24, only fear the Lord and serve him. Buck up. That's the last part. You know, that's the last point. And learning how to make the best of bad decisions. Buck up. Fear the Lord. Serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. But if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both you and your king. You know, if we refuse to admit we made bad decisions, if we refuse to admit that we're backslidden, if we refuse to admit that it's our fault, that there's no backpedaling, that we're not just going to weasel our way out of our bad decisions, if we refuse to just buck up and do right going forward, you know, then it shouldn't surprise us if we end up consumed for having despised the spirit of grace. And this is a very gracious thing that God's doing here for Israel, isn't it? Saying, look, you just made a horrible decision. But because you're my people, if you'll just keep fearing me and serving me going forward, you know, we can leave this in the past. And we can do right. And you'll still be my people. And we can still do great things for God. We can still make the best of bad decisions. Go ahead and pray.